Hello, and welcome to Adventures in Neuropathology with your favorite neuropathologist, Andrea Gilbert. Today, we're going to be talking about multiple sclerosis. I'm going to break this up into a multi-part series. In the first part, we'll talk about pathogenesis. Uh, and the subsequent parts, we'll talk about uh, what multiple sclerosis looks like under the microscope. Um, so stay tuned for those additional sections. But for this first section, we, we need to talk about some fundamentals of how the um, uh, central and peripheral nervous system work uh, so that we can better understand how multiple sclerosis works. So if we take a look at the different um, parts of the nervous system, we can break it up into two uh, basic sections. So there's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Both of them contains both of them contain neurons, which are uh, these yellow structures depicted in the diagram. The neuron has uh, multiple parts to it. So the central uh, cell body here. Uh, coming off the cell body, we have these dendrites, which facilitate connections with other neurons. And then the large axon coming off of the neuron right here. So we see this large yellow axon here and here. The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system both have neurons that, um, that, that look like this. So these axons, you can kind of think of them like an electric wire that is carrying electric signals from one location to another. And in order for those electric, electrical signals to be properly propagated over a course of long distances, uh, they, they need to be insulated. So the function of the um, uh, myelin here is basically to insulate the electrical signals passing through the axons. And in the central nervous system um, versus the peripheral nervous system, the myelin uh, that, that surrounds or insulates these uh, axons here, uh, that myelin is provided by different cells depending on whether in, they're in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. So in the central nervous system, we have oligodendroglial cells in which one oligodendroglial cell can myelinate multiple, multiple uh, neurons, so up to, say, 50 neurons or so. Um, and this becomes important because when you have damage to the oligos or, if, or, or oligodendroglial cells, for short, they're called oligos. So if you have damage to the oligos, then that is um, concerning because one oligo can myelinate up to 50 different neurons. So it's, it, it's a big blow to the central nervous system if you have a loss of just one of these cells. Uh, certainly it's a, it's a marked, um, injury to the central nervous system if you have a loss of um, multiple of the oligodendroglial cells. Okay, in the peripheral nervous system, uh, the same function is provided by a different cell, uh, and that cell is called Schwann cells. So the Schwann cells, uh, just one Schwann cell will myelinate just one little section of the, uh, of the axon. So here we have one axon uh, in this diagram that is myelinated by three separate cells that are 100% dedicated to this neuron. Um, this is usually the case. Of course, there's always exceptions, but um, for, for the most part, you can uh, have the idea that one Schwann cell pretty much myelinates one axon. Uh, and this is what it looks like under the uh, electron microscope. This is the ultrastructural um, appearance of this, where you have the center axon uh, with the little tubules going through the axon. Um, and then we can see the myelin here. It's cut in cross-section. Um, so you're cutting a, uh, a, a, you're thinking about cutting this tube uh, across the center. So you're seeing a cross section here. So this is the normal appearance in a diagram um, perspective. In a um, the actual uh, cells, they look like this. This is an oligodendroglial cell. Um, and this slide is from Narek Arkun. I like it because it has a, a little smiley face here. But this is a normal oligodendroglial cell. Under the, the light microscopy using our, our usual stain, which is the H&E stain, it, it doesn't look like much. But believe me, they, they have a lot of um, important functions that they do. And one of them being to myelinate uh, neurons. 
Okay, so if we look again at myelination of the of the central versus the peripheral nervous system, this is an LFB PAS stain. So this is a Luxol fast blue stain. And what this is showing is myelin in the central versus the peripheral nervous system. And this is where that um, that transition zone is. So you have uh, you have many axons running um, in, in, uh, different ways from the central to the peripheral and then the peripheral to the central nervous systems. And this is the transition zone where, uh, an oligodendroglial cell, uh, will stop myelinating in the central nervous system. And then that axon becomes myelinated by a Schwann cell in the peripheral nervous system. So this is what myelin looks like. And the reason why I'm, I'm focusing so much here on myelin is because uh, multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease. And demyelinating diseases is um, a, an umbrella term that includes a lot of different diseases, and I've included a few here. Um, and it's not to be a list to memorize, and I'm just saying that multiple sclerosis is uh, one of several demyelinating diseases. So if you ever hear me say demyelinating diseases, uh, multiple sclerosis is by far the most uh, well-known and, and most common of these, um, but uh, just know that there are many other diseases that can cause demyelination. Okay, so what is the cause? of multiple sclerosis? And the the answer to that question is nobody really knows. Nobody really knows what the answer to that question is. Um, however, we have an idea and we believe that it's probably a autoimmune disease of some sort. Uh, the exact antigen to which um, uh, the person's body is responding is not well characterized. It's not uh, well understood. However, this is what we think is happening. So basically there is some sort of antigen and what exactly that antigen is, is, is still very much under uh, investigation, but there's something that the body is reacting to. So basically there are T cells, uh, which are represented in this diagram by uh, these green cells here. Uh, and the T cells interact with the antigen presenting cells, which are supposed to be these, uh, these purple um, little cells here. The T cells or the green cells here um, interact with the antigen presenting cells and then also B cells, and they become sensitized or act, uh, uh, re reactive to some protein that is in the myelin. And so the T cells, they come out of the blood vessel. These are endothelial cells representing the blood vessel wall here. And the, the T cells, they come out of the endothelial cells and they're reacting to some antigen that has um, uh, been um, identified by B cells, which are these kind of turquoisey little cells here. Uh, these are B cells or plasma cells that um, develop these, um, these autoantibodies. Um, and the T cells will react and they will uh, interact with macrophages, which are these blue cells here, which also come out of the um, uh, blood vessel. And the macrophages will eat up the myelin. Um, and so what this looks like under the microscope is there's a bunch of myelin uh, that is within a whole lot of macrophages. So looking at this under the microscope, what we see is we'll see inflammatory cells, which include mostly T cells, which are these green cells. And you might have a few little B cells, but the vast majority are going to be T cells. And then there will also be a whole lot of um, macrophages, which are these blue cells here, and the macrophages are eating up the myelin, and the myelin is represented by this gray structure here, which is myelinating this axon, which is the yellow guy here, um, which is part of the neuron here. And so what we'll see is a whole bunch of macrophages and um, a few lymphocytes, mostly T cells with a few little B cells as well. Um, and just for completeness, this guy here is representing a astrocyte, uh, which is forming part of this blood-brain barrier here.
uh, that it makes up with the uh, endothelial cells. So, so basically the end result of all of this is that the myelin gets destroyed, the myelin gets lost, the myelin gets damaged, um, and the axons are mostly preserved. Um, but over time, the axons will under, um, the axons are left naked without myelin, and if they don't get remyelinated over time, then they can get injured and they can die, and the uh, the the corresponding neuron will die as well. So if you have axonal death, uh, the death of the underlying axon after that myelin gets uh, torn to pieces, if you have axonal death, then the neuron that is associated with that axon uh, will also die, and then the clinical symptoms that the patient experiences uh, will um, be permanent or irreversible once that, uh, that neuron dies after the axon gets injured because its myelin got, um, uh, eaten away by macrophages responding to some sort of, uh, antigen stimulus. So the different symptoms that um, patients with multiple sclerosis can experience are quite varied because multiple sclerosis involves a wide variety of the different parts of the central nervous system. So the different symptoms that a patient experiences is going to be very um, varied depending on where in the brain and where in the central nervous system uh, the the um, demyelination is affecting. So if the demyelination affects the optic nerve, then that patient is going to have significant visual uh, symptoms. If that um, is affecting some part of the um, basilar pons, then the person might have um, muscle weakness of some sort of, uh, to some degree. And uh, multiple sclerosis, it very much likes to affect the uh, periventricular white matter just around the uh, corpus callosum and the angle of the uh, ventricles here. The exact reason for that is not uh, well known, but it does like to affect those areas. So multiple sclerosis can affect a, a wide variety of different parts of the body, uh, just de depending on uh, where the demyelination happens. So the symptoms of multiple sclerosis are very uh, varied depending on where in the central nervous system the demyelination occurs. So if it occurs in the spinal cord, you can have a variety of different symptoms, including musculoskeletal, altered uh, sensation, bowel and bladder incontinence. Um, if it occurs in the brain, you can have cognitive issues. If it occurs in the uh, uh, optic tract, um, there can be visual issues. So the symptoms come and go, and the symptoms can be very varied depending on which part of the central nervous system uh, is involved. Okay, so in multiple sclerosis, there's different kinds. Um, the most common out of all of these is the relapsing remitting kind, um, and the which is this bottom one here. The three on the top are less common, however, uh, more severe. So basically, the, the typical course of the average multiple sclerosis, the average patient with multiple sclerosis, is that person will have some sort of flare where their symptoms get much worse, much worse, much worse, and then they get better and they go back to baseline, but that baseline is a little bit worse than where they started. And then time will go by and they'll be fine, they'll be fine, and then they'll get another flare. And they'll, again, eventually that flare will pass and they'll come back to baseline, but that baseline is a little bit worse. And each time they have a flare, uh, they, they uh, come back to baseline, but that baseline gets worse and worse and worse, and eventually the, the disease will progress. That's different from the other three here um, where we see there's primary progressive where it just keeps getting worse and there's really no flares. Um, and then the worst one out of all of these is the progressive relapsing multiple sclerosis where it just keeps getting worse, get, get, getting worse and worse. Um, and in addition to that, they have flares along the way. Now, this is not relegated to just one patient can only have one of these. You can have um, patients experience um, more than one of these. So I like this diagram here because it associates 
how the patient is um, experienced the 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 uh, symptoms and neurologic dysfunction over time in in uh, context of what's going on in the body. So. In this diagram here, this is an oligodendroglial cell, and these are three axons that are being myelinated by the oligodendroglial cell. Okay, so we've got one oligo and three axons. Um, uh, keeping in mind that in the real in the real body, uh, one oligo can myelinate up to fifty different neurons, uh, fifty different axons, each one belonging to a different neuron. So, uh, one oligo here is in, in this diagram all, um, myelinating three axons, but in real life, it's actually quite more than that. So, the oligo experiences some sort of injury. Um, and there are episodes of demyelination and remyelination associated with worsening and then resolving symptoms. Over time, the oligos, they, they um, undergo such injury that they end up dying. And so what happens is the axons, they're, they're initially, they're okay. They start to lose their myelination. They start to lose that, that, um, that protective covering that also helps transmit their electrical signals down to um, the muscles or nerves, et cetera. And these axons, they um, are more susceptible to injury because now they no longer have that, that nice thick rim of myelin. And so what ends up happening is then the axons start to die. And, um, uh, and without that remyelination, the axons start to die and therefore the neurons start to die. And so what ends up happening is that a, a patient experiences worsening and worsening and worsening um, stages, um, disease severity. So what is the cause of all of this? Well, it's not really well known why this is um, occurring. Uh, it does seem to have some genetic factors and some environmental factors. So if a patient has, um, if a person has a first degree relative who's been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, they do have a higher risk of developing multiple sclerosis. There also seems to be some sort of information uh, that there's some sort of environmental factor. And the reason for this is that the prevalence of uh, multiple sclerosis occurring um, in people who live in northern latitudes is much higher than people who live around the equator and in southern latitudes. Um, so this is a example of the world distribution of multiple sclerosis. And you can see how in the, the northern latitudes, um, uh, the 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 prevalence or the incidence is, is much higher than people who live around the equator. And that uh, follows people. So if people migrate from north to south before the age of 15, then that seems to reduce the risk of multiple sclerosis. Conversely, if people migrate from a southern uh, peri uh, a southern latitude around the equator and they go to the north, that increases their risk. Um, and so there's still a lot to learn about multiple sclerosis. Right now, we don't have a whole lot of information. That is a uh, topic that is under heavy investigation. Um, so that is our whirlwind tour of the introduction of the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. In addition, uh, in further um, um, series, and in further parts of this series, I'll be talking about the microscopic recognition of uh, multiple sclerosis and what does multiple sclerosis look like under the microscope. All right, so that uh, uh, wraps it up for this current show. Please join us next time on Adventures in Neuropathology. Be sure to check us out on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. All right, thank you. Have a good day.